Life is all about challenges, and attempting to overcome them is a fundamental part of who we are. The size and nature of these challenges does differ from person to person, but we're all striving to accomplish something in our own way, and this is a concept that has been embraced wholeheartedly by video games. As in life, within video games, there are many different ways challenges have been represented, but one of the most common interpretations has revolved around the concept of overcoming an adversary. This was true in the earliest video games that were digital ports of age-old games like Noughts and Crosses or Tic Tac Toe, Drafts or Checkers, and even Table Tennis. And as technology developed, this concept moved on to more sophisticated interpretations. One of the most obvious was the creation of predetermined challenges. These would still require a player to be adaptive, just as they would when facing a random experience or opponent, but by their very nature, developers could make the experience much more controlled, and therefore much more sustainable, and they did this by creating different levels that would increase in difficulty. By then adding narratives that would act as a source of motivation to persevere even when faced with challenges that may seem often insurmountable, the final piece of the puzzle was then to figure out what exactly represented a good challenge. It's something that has been a constant struggle, but as noted by Hidetaki Miyazaki, the creator of the Souls franchise, it's about making games that give players a sense of accomplishment by overcoming tremendous odds. The thing is though, no matter how well developers think they fine-tune their games through the core gameplay mechanics, various difficulty modes, optional challenges and tough side quests, there will always be those who just feel it wasn't challenging enough, and there will be those who just want to experience a game to its fullest beyond what the creators thought was possible. And that's where self-imposed fan challenges come to the forefront. These have existed for a long time now, from beating the original Mario without ever hitting the run button, through to more recently beating the entire Souls franchise without even getting hit. And Final Fantasy is of course no exception here. There are plenty of unique challenges people have come up with over the years. And that's exactly what we're going to be running through today. So my name is Daryl, and these are, in my opinion at least, the 7 self-imposed fan challenges that are probably the hardest to finish. And as a side note, I will be putting links in the description to guides if you want to try and attempt these challenges yourself. But with that, we are going to start things off with Final Fantasy XII's 122333 No License Board Challenge. With Final Fantasy XII having essentially two versions thanks to the original release and its subsequent remaster as the Zodiac Age, which was of course based around the international Zodiac job system, there is quite a wide array of challenges gamers have come up with to try and test themselves, even with additions like Trial Mode already being added in. Some of these relate to mechanics, such as restricting yourself to only using certain jobs, while others prohibit the use of certain characters, specifically trying to complete the game only using one or two of them, as opposed to the standard party complement. These challenges require players to plan effectively and come up with additional layers of strategy in order to progress, but they are quite tame compared to one particular playthrough challenge that combines two elements together to create something rather devilish. The 122333 No License Board Challenge. The first part relates to each character's starting level when you encounter them within the game's natural story progression. The idea is that after being acquired, none of these characters are allowed to gain any additional experience, making it a pretty standard low level game. To make this particular aspect easier, if you are playing a version of the game based around the International Zodiac job system, you can use weak mode, which has every character set to level 1 with no opportunity for growth. This is unlocked after finishing trial mode. The second part of this challenge then comes from coupling this aspect with no access to the license board at all. It makes things just that bit more complicated as it provides restrictions around spells, abilities and equipment. Time then becomes your best friend, as strategies for success need to rely on using farmed items and in general doing chip damage over time. It means the utilisation of moats, which enable for the casting of spells outside of licences, is very important, as is the acquisition of weapons that don't require licences to be equipped and used. In short, it seems absolutely horrid, but it is possible. 
Many years ago, a YouTuber called Jing Yi Kong uploaded a full playthrough based on the International Zodiac Job System version of the game, where not only did they finish the game using weak mode and no license board, they also managed to find a way of beating Yizmat within the same playthrough, something that literally took hundreds of hours. It's a challenge that is certainly not for the faint of heart, especially due to the time commitment, but things are only going to get worse. Which leads us onto our next challenge, the Final Fantasy VII Half Day in No Saves Challenge. Now, on face value, this challenge may not seem too complicated, as Final Fantasy VII is, in essence, actually pretty easy to complete, especially if there are no stipulations in place surrounding what you can or can't do during your playthrough. But due to the two stipulations that are in place for this particular challenge, it's not one to be scoffed at, as it ramps up the pressure by adding time and the potential for failure to the equation. The Livestream.net actually listed this as their hardest potential playthrough of the game, which goes to highlight how deceptive it can be. The first aspect, time, relates to Final Fantasy VII needing to be completed within 12 hours of literal time. This in itself is a challenging feat, and due to it being based around literal time as opposed to in-game time, it means the playthrough needs to account for things like the consumption of food, answering the door, and even taking bathroom breaks. The second, the potential for failure, relates to the challenge prohibiting the use of save files at any point during the playthrough. The run has to be a perfect run, as any game over screen requires starting right back at the beginning, which means the challenge might as well start right back at the beginning as well. And obviously, when time becomes a critical factor, the room for error just creeps in, making this particular criteria quite harsh, and it means that planning and practice are of the utmost importance when it comes to doing a successful run. Speedrunners have shown though that this challenge is possible, and according to speedrun.com, 26 people have so far managed to not only achieve the feat, but also record themselves doing so when playing the original PlayStation version. The record on that site is currently set at 7 hours, 14 minutes and 40 seconds, which is insane. It's held by a gamer called Luzbelheim, and if you want some tips on how you can tackle this challenge yourself, it's well worth checking out their playthrough. Our third challenge is the Final Fantasy IX Level 1 Challenge. People have been finding out new things related to Final Fantasy IX for years now, and even so recently as 2013, a YouTuber called Garland the Great uncovered a side quest that had remained dormant for over a decade. It stands to reason that some of the challenge playthroughs would therefore be rather insane, and the level 1 challenge very much ticks that box. The main criteria revolves around the traditional challenge of not leveling characters once they have been obtained, and for this, Final Fantasy IX actually works quite well. Bosses grant no experience when vanquished, and if the player chooses to win random encounters by stopping or petrifying the enemies they face, then no experience is gained either, but AP is. There are difficulties around keeping everyone level 1 though, for example, Amaranth's starting level is related to Blank's level, and much thought has to be put into keeping everyone at level 1, despite encountering situations where gaining experience is perhaps not possible to escape. And for insight into this, I'd recommend checking out Hippophant's guide on how to beat Ozma at level 1. You can, as that guide suggests, also choose to beat Ozma at level 1 too, but unfortunately as some optional bosses like Ozma and Hades do give experience points, you can't beat them and finish the game at level 1. If you'd like to continue though, you can make sure you distribute the experience to keep the party's levels as low as possible throughout the rest of the playthrough. As an aside, I don't know if it's actually possible, but according to a user on GameFAQs called MrBojan58, you can undertake the low level challenge and also undertake the perfect game challenge where you need to collect every single item in the game. But I couldn't find any evidence anywhere to suggest that this has actually been completed by anyone, despite their assertions. Anyway, as mentioned, to complete this hypothetical challenge, you'd need to acquire everything in the game, including Excalibur 2, which for reference, we listed as one of the hardest ultimate weapons to obtain in general in one of our previous videos, as you have to get to Memoria within 12 hours, and that's no easy feat by itself. Feel free to give this a whirl though and share your attempts if you think it's doable, but it may end up just being an impossible dream. Fourth on our list is the Final Fantasy VIII No Junction Challenge, which in my eyes is one of the quintessential Final Fantasy challenge runs. 
but that doesn't mean it's remotely straightforward, especially compared to a standard low-level game within Final Fantasy VIII, as much of the game is of course built around the junction system which was yet again the brainchild of Hiroyuki Ito. In many ways though, this challenge is perfect because there are plenty of people who loathe the junction system. There really is a whole love-hate relationship surrounding it, and this has often led to fans coming out in passionate defense of the system. Detractors point to how needlessly integrated it is with pretty much every single aspect of the game, but also the tedium that's associated with having to acquire all of the magic that you will need to junction, which consequently means restrictions apply to the usage of magic if you don't want to have to reacquire it. With this challenge, all of those worries just fade away, but at the cost of not being able to perform pretty much every single action within the game, due to just how integrated this system was with everything. With the junction system tossed aside, you will only ever be able to use standard attacks and limit breaks, so learning how to best make use of them is critical to success against the game's many, many bosses. You will also be hindered in other ways too, as although the gaining of experience is perfectly acceptable during this challenge, Due to there being no use of the ammo RF command required to get pulse ammo, weapons such as Lionheart aren't possible to acquire, and this also means that certain limit breaks aren't possible to acquire either. To succeed, Reliance therefore falls on the utilisation of Questis. She becomes essential to success due to the wide array of blue magic she has that doesn't rely on junctioning to perform. Likewise, Selfie can also help in this regard, although hardcore players running this challenge do consider using the end as somewhat cheap. For more information, well, you can thank Hippophant again, as they pulled together a rather succinct guide on how to navigate your way through a no junction challenge run. But even with the guide, it won't be a walk in the park and will likely require many, many save reloads. So good luck if you're attempting this one. If all this comes across as sounding pretty easy though, you can combine the two, low level game and no junctioning. Realm Arony87 on GameFAQs seems to think it's very much possible. You just have to be quite specific around strategy and heavily rely on Renault's Invincible Moon Limit Break to see you through to completion. For our fifth challenge, we are looking at Final Fantasy III on the DS, specifically the Freelancer Only Challenge. With Sakaguchi looking to push the franchise to new heights, Final Fantasy III saw significant evolutions, and one particular area of focus was jobs. These were introduced within the original Final Fantasy, but there were significant limitations as outside of upgrading them, whatever you chose at the beginning was locked in, and the choice was also rather limited. With Final Fantasy III, loads of new jobs were added, but they also gave players the ability to change jobs, which allowed for the creation of so many different strategies. But of course, this was an optional mechanic, and this particular challenge run tasks players with attempting to finish the game by only ever using the default freelancer job. Much like the previous challenge related to Final Fantasy VIII, this does mean that the majority of abilities present within Final Fantasy III are rendered obsolete, but you can still use basic white magic and black magic as you progress, and this white magic will actually become pretty useful compared to various items later on. The good thing is that freelancers can still equip pretty decent gear, and this should be sought out at every single available opportunity. The recommended strategy in this regard, which is provided in a guide created by J Rock Idol, is to have Lunith equip the Ultima Weapon and Excalibur, with the other three characters rocking the Aegis Shield and Crystal Shield for maximum survivability. As has been the common theme so far, grinding will be one of the keys to success. You will need to level up characters as much as possible, acquire plenty of gill for purchasing items and equipment, and make sure you've done enough extracurricular things to acquire the best gear freelancers can wear. This challenge is something that gives Final Fantasy III a rather unique twist, even if it is a tad on the sadistic side. To complement this though, we then move on to our penultimate challenge, the Final Fantasy I Solo White Mage Challenge. With the original Final Fantasy now being so old, gamers have had more than three decades to come up with some rather unique challenge playthroughs, and these have very much evolved over time too. One of the more popular iterations was to run through the game after assigning each character as the same job type. This provided a natural restriction as moves would no longer be made available, however in most cases it didn't actually affect too much due to the damage output and with decent strategies finishing the game was very much achievable. 
So how could this be pushed even further? The only way was to use the weakest physical class, which saw the advent of the Four White Mage challenge. Solving this particular challenge was something of a conundrum in the earlier days, but in more modern times it's proved to be a challenge that clearly wasn't difficult enough, and so some clever souls decided to up the ante even further by evolving the challenge to only allowing one character to be alive, which saw the creation of the Solo White Mage challenge. The premise is that as soon as you encounter your first battle in the game, every character except your solo white mage must die to that devilish imp and never be revived again. In the early stages, this playthrough is then about outlasting enemies. Due to the white mage's healing abilities, many enemies can just be chipped down, but even random encounters do have the potential to become a banana skin until you start to get better equipment that can boost up your hit points. Now the funny, or I guess not so funny aspect of this challenge, is that some have chosen to take it even further by placing additional restrictions. Anami, for example, who wrote a solo white mage guide, suggested that if you're finding the challenge too straightforward, you can choose not to undergo the class change, and that if you're using emulators, you should restrict yourself to the same criteria as those playing the original version had, only being allowed to save during pre-designated save locations using inns, tents, cabins, or houses. It's certainly one of the more interesting challenges out there, and it just goes to show how things can definitely escalate over time. And that leads us nicely onto our final challenge, the Final Fantasy X No Sphere Grid, No Summon, No Overdrive, No Escape, No No Encounters, No Blitzball, No Customize Challenge. Many of the challenges we've featured on this list look to restrict players in one or two ways, either by taking away the usage of certain game mechanics or prohibiting the use of certain characters. And then there's this challenge, which uses Final Fantasy X to take self-imposed fan challenges to the next level by prohibiting access to pretty much everything and anything. Now, no sphere grid challenges have been doing the rounds for some time, and they are essentially the equivalent to a low level game. It's challenging, but with enough preparation it's more than doable with lots of knowledge around the rest of the game's mechanics. Using overdrives and summons, for example, can tip the scales in your favour due to their extreme burst damage, but what if they were taken away? It immediately changes the entire complexion of the experience, and with this particular challenge then adding further restrictions about not being able to run away from any battles no matter how dire, not being able to use the No Encounters ability to avoid conflicts, not being able to play Blitzball for the acquisition of rare items, and not even being able to use the Customize ability to create more powerful gear, then, well, you have a challenge that will pretty much push anyone to their limits. Not only do you need a considerable amount of patience, as you attempt to steal good items and keep reloading to ensure you get good drops from bosses, you also need to have luck in terms of the moves that certain enemies will use against you as that can cause things to unravel pretty quickly. Ultimately though, it all boils down to the final encounter against Braska's final Aeon. Many have made it this far, only to come a cropper due to the difficulty that this boss poses, but after years upon years of trying, the YouTuber called Lucky One did manage to accomplish what many felt was impossible, by becoming the first known person in the world to defeat Braska's final Aeon and finish the No Sphere Grid no summon, no overdrive, no escape, no no encounters, no blitzball, no customized challenge. It was a monumental achievement, and it shows how extremely granular the game's mechanics can be so that they can be manipulated for that final encounter. I'd recommend checking out the comments on the video, especially if you'd like to try and attempt this challenge for yourself, because that knowledge is there for everyone to see. I'd say this challenge also serves as a testament to the games themselves though, it's difficult to imagine that the creators ever envisioned gamers manipulating things in the way they have across these seven challenges, but I think the fact that gamers can and can still finish off the experience speaks volumes for everything that was created. But anyway, with that, my list has now come to a conclusion. They were the seven self-imposed fan challenges that I feel were probably the hardest to complete across the various main series Final Fantasy games. I'd love to hear in the comments which you felt was the most extreme, but also, how many of you guys have actually attempted and completed these challenges? Also, are there any you felt warranted a place on this list that we've missed out? Let us know in the comments and if you enjoyed the video, please hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. If you'd also like to become more invested in us as creators and join us on our journey to create compelling content around the franchise we all love, 
then we'd love to have you as part of the Mog Squad on Patreon or here via YouTube membership. You can support the channel for just $1 on Patreon, but for $2 per month, you get access to our activity feed where we talk about and discuss our upcoming plans and how we're progressing. Anyway guys, this is Daryl signing out. I will see you all next time for more Final Fantasy videos.